It happened one day that the doctor was sitting in his kitchen talking with the cat mates man who had come to see him with a stomach ache. Why don't you give up being a people doctor and be an animal doctor? Asked the cat's meat man. The parrot, Polynesia, was sitting in the window looking out at the rain and singing a cellar song to herself. She stopped singing and started to listen. You see, doctor, the cat's meat man went on. You know all about animals, much more than what these hair bats do. That book you wrote about cats, why, it's wonderful. I can't read or write myself, or maybe I would write some books. But my wife, Theodosia, she's a scholar, she is, and she read your book to me. Well, it's wonderful. That's all can be said, wonderful. You might have been a cat yourself. You know the way they think. And listen, you can make a lot of money doctoring animals. Do you know that? You see, I would send all the old women who had sick cats or dogs to you. And if they did not get sick fast enough, I could put something in the meat. I sell them to make them sick, sick. Oh no, said the doctor quickly. You must not do that. That would not be right. Oh, I did not mean real sick, answered the cat's meat man. Just a little something to make them droppy. Like was what I had reference to. But as you say, maybe it has quit fair on the animals. But they will get sick anyway. Because the old woman always no give um, mm -hmm. too much to eat. And look, all the farmers round about who had lamb horses and weak lambs. They would come, be an animal doctor. When the cat's meat man had gone, the parrot flew off the window onto the doctor table and said, That's man got sense. That's what you ought to do. Be an animal doctor. Give the silly people love. If they have not brain enough to see, you are the best doctor in the world. Take care of animals instant. They will soon find it out. Be an animal doctor. Oh, there are plenty of animal doctors said John Dolittle, putting the flower pots outside of the, on the window, sail to get the rain. Yes, there are plenty, said Polynesia, but none of them are any good at all. Now listen, doctor, and I will tell you something. Did you know that animals can talk? I know that parrot can talk, said the doctor. Oh, we parrot can talk in two languages, people language and bird language, said Polynesia. Proudly, if I say, Polly wants a cracker, you understand me, but hear this, kaka, oi, pee pee, good gracious, cried the doctor, what does that mean, that means, is the porridge hot yet, in bird language, my, you don't say so, said the doctor, you never talk that way to me before. What would have been the good, said Polynesia, dusting some cracker crumbs off his left wing. You would not have understood me if I had. Tell me some more, said the doctor, all excited, and he rushed over to the dresser drawer and come back with a bunch of book and a pencil. Now don't go too fast, and I will write it down. This is interesting, very interesting, something quite new. Give me the birds A, B, C first, slowly now. So that was the way the doctor came to know that animals had a language of their own and could talk to one another. And all that afternoon, while it was raining, Polynesia sat on the kitchen table, giving him bird words to put down in the book. At tea time, when the dog Jeep came in, the parrot said to the doctor, See, he is talking to you. Look to me. As if he were stretching his ear, said the doctor. But animals don't always speak with their mouths, said the parrot in a high voice, raising her eyebrow 
They talk with their ears, with their feet, with their tails, with everything sometimes. They don't want to make a noise. Do you see now the way he twitching up one side of his nose? What's that mean? asks the doctor. That means, can't you see it has stopped raining? Polynesia answered. He's asking you a question. Dogs nearly always use their nose for asking questions. After a while, with the parrot help, the doctor got to learn the language of the animals so well that he could talk to them himself and understand everything they said. Then he gave up being a people doctor altogether. As soon as the cat smith man had told everyone that John Dolittle was going to become an animal doctor, old ladies began to bring him their pet pugs and poodles, who had eaten too much cake, and farmers came many miles to show him sick cows and sheep. One day a pole horse was brought to him, and the poor thing was terribly glad to find a man who could talk in horse language. You know, doctor, said the horse, that bat over the high hill knows nothing at all. He has been treating me six weeks now for a span. What I need is spectacles. I am going blind in one eye. There is no reason why a horse should not wear glasses, the same as people. But the stupid man over the hill never even looked at my eye. He kept on giving me big pills. I tried to tell him. But he could not understand a word of horse language. What I need is spectacles. Of course, of course, said the doctor. I will get you some at once. I would like a pair like yours, said the horse. Only green. They will keep the sun out of my eyes. While I am plowing the 50 acre field. Certainly, said the doctor. Green one you shall have. You know the trouble is, sir said the plow horse as the doctor opened the front door to let him out. The trouble is that anybody think he can doctor animal just because the animal don't complain. As a matter of fact, it takes a much cleverer man to be a really good animal doctor than it does to be good people's doctor. My farmer's boy thinks he know all about horses. I wish you could see him. His face is so fat. He looks as tough, he had no eyes, and he has got as much brain as a potato bug. He tried to put a mustard plaster on me last week. Where did he put it? asked the doctor. Oh, he did not put it anywhere on me, said the horse. He only tried to. I kick him into the duck pond. Well, well, said the doctor. I am a pretty quick creature as a rule, said the horse. Very patient with people. Don't make much fuss. But it was bad enough to have that bat giving me the wrong medicine. And when the red faced Bobby started to monkey with me, I just could not bear it anymore. Did you hurt the boy much? asked the doctor. Oh no, said the horse. I kicked him in the right place. The bat's looking after him now. When will my glasses be ready? I will have them for you next week, said the doctor. Come in again. Tuesday. Good morning. Then John Doolittle got a fine. Big pair of green spectacles. And the plow horse stopped going blind in one eye and could see as well as ever. And soon it became a common sight to see farm animals wearing glasses. In the country round Puddleby, and a blind horse was a thing unknown. And so it was with all the other animals that were brought to him as soon as they found that he could talk their language. They told him where the pen was and how they felt and of course it was easy for him to care them. Now all these animals went back and told their brothers and friends that there was a doctor in a little house with the big garden who really was a doctor. And whenever any creature got sick, not only horses and cows, and dogs, but all the little things of the field, like harvest mice and water balls, badgers and bears, they came at once to his house on the edge of town, so that his big garden was nearly always crowded with animals, trying to get in to see him. There were so many 
that came that he had to have a special door made for the different kinds. He rode horses over the front door, cows over the side door, and sheep on the kitchen door. Each kind of animal had a separate door. Even the mice had a tiny tunnel made for them into the cellar, where they waited patiently in row for the doctor to come round to them. And so, in a few years' time, every living thing for miles and miles got to know about John Dolittle, MD, and the birds who flew to other countries in the winter told the animals in foreign land of the wonderful doctor of Poodleby on the Mars, who could understand their talk and help them in their troubles. In this way, he became famous among the animals all over the world. Better known even then, he had been among the folk of the West Country, and he was happy and liked his life very much. One afternoon, when the doctor was busy writing in a book, Polynesia sat in the window, as she nearly always did, looking out at the leaves blowing about in the garden. Presently, she laughed aloud. What is it, Polynesia? asked the doctor looking up from his book. I was just thinking, said the parrot, and she went on looking at the leaves. What were you thinking? I was thinking about people, said Polynesia. People make me sick. They think they are so wonderful. The world has been going on now for thousands of years, hasn't it? And the only thing in animal language that people have learned to understand is that when a dog wangs his tail, he means I am glad it's funny, isn't it? You are the very first man to talk like us. Oh, sometimes people annoy me dreadfully. Such airs they put on, talking about the dumb animals. Dumb? Oh. Why, I know a uh, Macau, ones who could say good morning in seven different ways without once opening his mouth. He could talk every language and Greek and all professor with a grey beard both him. But he did not stay. He said the old man didn't talk, Greek cried. And he could not stand listening to him teach the language wrong. I often wonder what became of him. That bird knew more geography than people. Whoever knew. People, golly, I suppose if people ever learn to fly like any common hedge sparrow, we shall never hear the end of it. You are a wise old bird, said the doctor. How old are you really? I know that parrot and an apple sometimes lives to be very, very old. I can never be quite sure of my age, said Polynesia. It's either a hundred and eighty-three or a hundred and eighty-two. But I know that when I first came here from Africa, King Charles was still hiding in the oak tree. Because I saw him, he looked scared to death. 